Accessing the Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs. Tune in each week as we study God's Word together. Welcome to this another edition of the Ancient Landmark. My name is Jared Jacobs. I'm so thankful to be with you. We might once again study from the Book of God. If you have a Bible, go ahead and get it out and turn with me to the Book of Jonah. We're going to be studying from the Book of Jonah at this time, and we encourage you to go ahead and, and follow along. Feel free to take any notes that you'd like to take as we study from this most important Old Testament book. You look back in this book, we find that it is a short book. It's only four chapters long, and sometimes folks have uh, remembered at least one part about Jonah, the part about where Jonah was thrown overboard, and he was then swallowed up by that great fish or whale, that there held him for about three days and nights until he was finally uh, taken and then uh, vomited up on the land and went on his way to preach uh, God's word to the city of Nineveh. Probably a lot of us have heard that story over the years. Probably a lot of us have heard it perhaps when small children or maybe your small children have heard that story. But I want us to understand that whenever you look at the book of Jonah, Jonah is not a story merely for young children. That's not what it's about. In fact, when we look into that story of Jonah, what we see is a, a really the gospel uh, there for the Old Testament. What we see here are the words of God being taken and being sent to a heathen nation for the purpose of saving them from the wrath of God. And so I want us to look at that and to study that together at this time, the book of Jonah. And we're going to begin in Jonah chapter 1 and verse 1. And we're not going to read every single verse, but we're not going to look at a lot of this so we get the context and we get the story here that was, was happening in, in this time period. Now Jonah, in Jonah chapter 1 and verse 1, says that he was the son of Amittai. He is a son of a prophet. It's interesting, you could look back in the book of Amos, and Amos said that I'm not the prophet nor a son of a prophet. And yet Jonah was just that. He was the prophet, and in fact, he was the son of a prophet. Jonah lived in the days of Jeroboam II, uh, there, and the king, uh, during that divided kingdom time period. There, Jeroboam II. And so Jeroboam II is ruling in the kingdom of Israel, just like his daddy did. And so uh, you have this situation going on where after several years, uh, now his uh, ancestor, I suppose you should say, is there ruling, not his daddy, but his ancestor. And so Jeroboam the second is ruling. Jonah had other prophecies too. He, this is not the only prophecy. This is not the only uh, prophetic word that was given by Jonah. But it is the one for which he is probably best known and it is the one that, that we read about and is given, like we said, uh, four chapters to this study. So you look in Jonah. He is the son of Amittai, the Bible says, and God told him to do something. He said to arise and go to the city of Nineveh. He said that great city. He said cry against it because of the wickedness that is there. The wickedness of these people has come up before God. And he says, I want you to go and cry against them. The purpose being that they might uh, repent of their sin, that they might turn from it. And this word that Jonah is going to give, this word of God that's going to be spoken, is a word that will tell them to repent or else. To repent or perish. Does that sound familiar? When you look into the New Testament, we find Jesus. We find John the Baptist and we find Jesus saying that very thing. Saying to repent or perish didn't they? And taught the people they needed to repent now before it's everlastingly too late. Well, Nineveh needed to do the same thing. And that's what Jonah was told to do, but he didn't go. And as we look, we find that in fact, he didn't go there. He went down, uh, there to Joppa and hopped a freighter ship. He hopped a, a cargo ship sailing across the Mediterranean Sea toward the west, toward the west, toward Tarshish. Uh, which we today would consider modern-day Spain. And so he goes that way. He goes in the exact opposite direction that he should have gone, especially if you think about where Joppa is. 
Nineveh is to the east and Tarshish is to the west and so he just goes in the exact opposite direction that he should have, didn't he? But that was not to be. For the Bible says in Jonah chapter 1 that God had a hand in this and he sent a strong wind, a great wind that would go and would uh, result in a great storm, a great tempest storm there against that ship. And so it's tossed back and forth and up and down and to and fro and the mariners, uh, they're throwing cargo off the ship. They're trying to do all the things they can to lighten this ship. And all the time Jonah lays underneath asleep. They say, what meanest thou old sleep? In other words, what are you doing? How can you be asleep at a time like this? Call upon the name of your God. We call upon our God. You call upon your God now. And you see if there was a way that we could be free from this. That we could be safe. And the Bible says as they continue to talk and work that the result was they cast lots on who was responsible and the lot fell on Jonah. No surprise there. And so they knew it was Jonah's fault. And in fact, they said, what have you done? And they remembered that he'd said he was running away. And that's exactly what we find. He was running away. He tried to. He couldn't do it. He tried to run away like Adam and Eve. He tried to run away like some other folks and it didn't work, did it? You can't run away from God. You cannot leave God. You cannot somehow hide from God. And this is evidence of that. So what are we going to do? He said, the answer is that you take and throw me overboard. If you throw me overboard, then all will be well. Well, they tried to, not to do that for a while, and they kept trying to row, and they kept trying to do different things to save the ship, but to no avail. Finally, they all agreed and threw him overboard. The Bible says in Jonah chapter 1, you, you're reading there with me, and notice what's happened in Jonah chapter 1 and verse 13. They took up Jonah, and when they did, and threw him forth, the sea ceased from the raging. In other words, they throw him overboard. When they throw him overboard, it's over. And now it's calm. And it got their attention for sure, didn't it? They understood that they were doing what was right. They understood that it was the God of Jonah that was in control, and they feared the Lord exceedingly. Verse 16, the Bible says that they feared the Lord exceedingly, and then they made vows. It says a sacrifice to the Lord, and they made vows. See that? But the Lord had prepared a fish to swallow up Jonah. And so Jonah chapter 2 records his feelings, his experiences, as Jonah is plunged into the sea, and he says, you look in Jonah chapter 2, and he says here that the waves compassed me about, I was in the midst of the sea, the waves uh, were compassed me about, the billows and all, he said, passed over me. And you just get this picture of a man as he's tossed into the sea, and now where he has fallen in, the sea overshadows him, the sea takes over. And he goes down, down, down. The weeds, the seaweeds wrap around his head. And they're, they're just all wrapped around. As he goes down and down and down. And he says, even to see the mountains of the sea. And the bars closed around me. Oh, he thought he was dead. He thought that was it. He thought that was the end. But God had something else planned. And so that fish swallowed him up. And he realizes in Jonah chapter 2, he says, they, in verse 8, they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to thee, uh, and with the voice of thanksgiving, I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And here, after those three days and nights, now the Lord speaks. In verse 10, he spoke to that fish, and that fish bombed him out. And now he's ready to go back again. Here during this time period, he realizes who is in charge. Jonah 2 verse 9, salvation is of the Lord. Now folks, that means something. That is key. That is important to see. That is important to understand. 
because that phrase is a phrase that spans the ages. Yes, my friend, salvation is of the Lord. And if people of any age, if people of any race, if people of any time, if people of any, any background, ethnic background, whatever it may be, if you want salvation, salvation is found with the Lord and no one else. It's not found in yourself. It's not found in, in, in men. It's not found in, in false gods and idols. It's not found with anyone else. It is found with the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. And he says, I now understand that. Continue to read, having been puked out, and now here he goes on back. Now the Bible says, he goes to Nineveh. And God again repeats what he had said earlier. Go into Nineveh, he says, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. You preach, you tell them exactly what I want you to say, God said, and nothing else. So Jonah rose, and he went to Nineveh this time. And you remember in Jonah 1, he rose and he went somewhere else. But this time in Jonah chapter 3, he arose and went to Nineveh. And there's no question that he was going, he was going to be obedient. Now Nineveh was a great city, a city of three days' journey. And the point being there that this city took three days for you to walk across. If you can imagine a city that is so large that whenever you enter the gates of the city, you would take you three days to walk across town from one end to the other. That's the size town we're talking about. This is a town whose walls were so massive that they could ride the horse and chariots up on the top of the walls. And they would ride around. Uh, there the, and, and do that. And so you could ride horse and chariots up on top of the walls. As no doubt the soldiers and guards and others would, would be around there on top of the walls. And they had that. This was a massive place. This was a huge place. This was called the robber city. And the reason why it was called the robber city was because the people would go out. Oftentimes their practice was to go out in bands and to go to this over to another town here, there, yon, and go raid, take their things, take the spoil, take the loot, the booty, the spoil, they'd take all of that, and they would come back with the folks' things, and then get inside the walls, their very strong uh, walls and gates and all of this, get inside, and no one could penetrate the wall. Nobody could do it at that time. And so they became feared by many because of just the wickedness that went on and basically were not answerable to anyone or so they thought. God says you're answerable to me. But nevertheless, they thought they were answerable to no one. And so this is a massive place. This is huge. And this place that seemed like they didn't need God and they needed God worse than anyone. And so Jonah goes in. And after one day's preaching, Preaching that yet forty days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. The people listen. And they listened to him all the way up and the words came into the ears of the king. And when the king heard these words, see, he demanded a feast. He demanded a fast, rather. He demanded a fast and sackcloth and ashes. And he says, who knows, but God may turn from his fierce anger. And so he commanded that no one would uh, have any kind of, uh, would, would be repenting. No one would, you know, act normally at all. No one's going to do that. You go in here in verse 7, here is the fast proclaimed, where he says, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. Let them do none of those things. Let them not feed, let them not drink water. Who can tell, verse 9, if God will turn and repent and turn away from the fierce wrath, anger, and that we perish not. Who knows? If God won't do that, we must repent. We must turn from our wicked ways. And that's what the king commanded, and that's what the folks did. Well, what happened? Well, God turned from his fierce anger, he did not destroy them. He saw their repentance. He saw what was going on and he said, I will not destroy them now. I'll not do it. And so, chapter 4.
How did Jonah act or react? Folks, Jonah chapter 4 says that it displeased Jonah exceedingly over the fact that this happened. He was very angry, verse 1. He was very angry with what happened. Oh, he was upset. Man, oh, he said, I tell you what, was that not the thing that I told you, uh, he says, when I was yet in my country? Now we get some of the background detail. Now we get some of the background from chapter 1. So evidently, whenever Jonah left and was headed toward Tarsus, before he left for Tarsus, he says, didn't I already tell you that I knew this was going to happen? This is why I fled. I knew you are a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger. I knew, he says, you were of great kindness and repents of that evil. He says, I knew you were going to do that. I knew that my preaching, your word, was going to produce this kind of repentance. I knew what was going to happen, and I didn't want it to happen. That's why I ran away, and I told you. I, that was my saying before I left my country. That was my saying. How about that? Jonah already knew, didn't he? But he said, I knew the kind of God I served. That says something about God, doesn't it? You know, sometimes people have a misconception of the God of heaven and they think, well, Old Testament God, while well, you talk about the Old Testament, why well, he's just all wrath and, and, and meanness and, and you know, strike you down and all this kind of thing. Not if you read Jonah 4. In Jonah 4, you get a full picture of God. Oh, that's not saying God didn't strike people dead. He struck people dead in the New Testament too. It's not saying God didn't get angry. God got angry in Old Testament and the New Testament. But in both Old Testament and New Testament, we also see a God who's merciful, who's gracious, who's loving and kind, and who wants his people to repent and turn to him. And that's what Jonah 4 says. He says, it's just better for me to die. I'd just rather die. Well, that wasn't going to be. And so he set up a place on the east side of town and built him a little booth or a little tent, lean-to type thing, a little shack where he could sit out there and watch. I'm just going to watch and see what happens. And the wind blew. The Lord prepared an east wind and, and that east wind blew and all oh, he was miserable. And so the Lord prepared a gourd. And the gourd came out in the night and then it unfolded itself and it gave him shade and, and comfort and he was happy. But the Lord then prepared a worm. And the worm ate the or to kill the gourd. And so it withered away, and then he was mad again. Hey, oh, I just wish I would have died, he said. I, it would do well for me to die, he says. I, it's better for me to die than to live. And God said to him in verse 9 of Jonah 4, does that well to be angry? In other words, is this good? Are you doing the right thing, you think, being angry? He said, I do well to be angry even to death. Talk about someone upset. Here it is. The Lord said, You had pity on a gourd that he says that for which you did not labor, you didn't make it grow. It came up in the night and it died in the night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand, a hundred and twenty thousand, he says, that cannot discern between the right hand and the left hand and also much cattle. And that's the end of that book. And you look at that and, and it's kind of an abrupt ending, isn't it? You look at this book in Jonah chapter 4 and verse 11 and this question leaves Jonah sitting by a withered gourd in the hot sun to ponder, to think about and to meditate upon the love, upon the grace, upon the mercy upon the kindness of God toward a lost people. That's where it leaves him. And thinking about that phrase, salvation is of the Lord. Folks, that's true. You look here in Jonah chapter 4, and, and we gave just a little synopsis of those chapters. That's, there's no question about that. There's many other things we could bring out as we look at that. But there is a point to this. 
We see it in that phrase in Jonah 2, 9, salvation is of the Lord. And really, whenever you look at the whole book, is that not the overall or overreaching theme of that book? And in a very real sense, Jonah 2, 9, where it says salvation is of the Lord, that phrase really is an overreaching theme of the whole Bible. Because when you look and see man in sin in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6, and man in sin there, and then from that point forward, man continuing to yield to temptation and sin, they continue to do that over and over and over again through the years, seeing as that's the case, and seeing as we know that that's what happened, then man needs a Savior. And that's what God promised in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. He promised a Savior. And from that point forward, we're, we read about the salvation, we read about the prophet, we read about the Messiah that is to come, this anointed one, and when we read about him and we read about his work and what he's going to do, he is a Savior, the Savior of his people. And that salvation which is of the Lord, the salvation not of Buddha, and it's not of, of, of Zen and of Buddhism, it's not of Shinto, it's not Confucius, it's not the salvation of Zoroaster, it's not the salvation of, uh, of, of some uh, Pope, it's not the salvation of anyone like that. It is the salvation that comes from the Lord. And that's what you're finding right here. And as you look into the book of Jonah, is there any wonder why someone would say that this is the gospel of the Old Testament? Because here's somebody who, who goes, he brings God's word to a lost people, and they repent, and they straighten up their lives, folks. That's what you see there, don't you? And that's what we find happening in this passage. And really, as you look into the book of Jonah, Jonah uh, this salvation we're talking about in Old Testament and New Testament, salvation really requires about five things. Salvation, whether you're talking about Old Testament or New Testament, requires five things. Number one, it demands God. <laughs> That's obvious. Salvation of the Lord demands God. Number two, it demands God's providence. And we'll notice that in this book of Jonah and also other books. But the providence of God, providence here, all that has to do with is simply God's way in which His will is accomplished through natural means. In other words, it is something that is independent of, of a miracle. It's not a miraculous thing. A miracle suspends natural law in order to be effective or in order to be real. All right? And so you take something that is a miracle. Jesus turned water into wine or Jesus walked upon the water or Moses threw the stick down and it became a snake, or when he put his hand in his, in his coat and brought it out and it was leprous and he put it back in and then it was clean again. You remember that? Or the various miracles the apostles performed, raising of the dead, all of these things are miraculous. That is, it is the suspension of natural law in order to, to fulfill something God wants. Uh, a lot of times it's, it's an attention getter. All right? Uh, here's Moses in Exodus chapter 3 and sees a bush that is burning but is not burned up. And he said, well, this is a great thing. This is a great sight. I need to go see what this is and see what manner of a bush it is that can burn and not be burned up. <coughs> now, when we think about providence, Providence is where God uses natural means to fulfill His will. All right, so the book of Esther, for instance, if you look back in the Old Testament book of Esther, Esther is filled with providence, just like this passage is. It says God had, uh, you know, prepared the wind. He had prepared a fish. He prepared a gourd. He prepared a worm. That's God's providence in those cases. You find God's providence... Uh, with Joseph, you remember, when they sold him into slavery in Gen Genesis 45 and verse 5, and he said, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. God's providence made it possible that his family, Joseph, his family, and all were saved alive because Jonah was there at the right place at the right time. It's his providence. And so you see that all the way through. There was no miracle performed upon, upon Joseph. And Jonah performed no miracle. 
See that? There was no miracle there. And Matthew chapter 12 says that as well. He says there was no miracle. Jonah didn't perform a miracle. He didn't do it. This is God's providence. So the, what's necessary for salvation in that general sense is God, God's providence, God's word. Isn't it? We need God's word. And then we need a preacher to preach. And we need a sinner who will listen and obey. And if you get those key elements or key ingredients together, you can have salvation. Now I'm going to show you how that works here in the book of Jonah. And then we're going to make some applications of that then in our own lives because that's going to be true for us as well. See, in that sense, it is, it, that salvation or the, or the need for salvation or the means of salvation are very similar then, aren't they? Oh, now I understand that, and I hope you understand that I'm not talking about a specific thing. Now, a specific act of, of salvation, that is to say, in the New Testament today, to believe on Christ and repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him and be baptized. You know, we understand that that's what God has said. We understand that's what God has revealed for folks today to do. That's what God wants folks today to be a part of and what they need to be active in. They didn't do that in the days of Jonah, did they? That's another covenant. That's another time period. And in fact, as you look at that, that these people are the Gentile people. But that overreaching theme or overreaching idea where you had God and he had his providence and his word and the preacher to preach that same word and the sinner that's going to listen and obey that word. There's where salvation comes. And that's where it's going to be. And that's what's going to happen here. These folks will be saved, not saved from their sins necessarily, but they will be saved from God's wrath and have the opportunity to continue to be a, a nation and all of that. They'll have that opportunity because they did what the Lord said. He turned from His wrath when they did what He said. So let's look into this passage. Let's look into this book of Jonah and see some things relative to that. We said here that salvation requires God. Well, it's, it's evident we see God all through this, don't we? It is God who calls Jonah. But it is God also who has seen Nineveh and seen their wickedness and seen the things that they were doing. You know, Jonah, Nineveh has been a part of Bible history since Genesis 10 and verse 11. It's been there, part of Bible history ever since then. And it continues to be so. And so here's God interested in those folks. He's interested in them just like he's interested in you. And just like he's interested in me. And so that's where it begins, doesn't it? It begins with God. And begins with him seen, but also putting the preacher and the sinner together. And that's what he's going to do. We're going to go ahead and take a break right now. And then we're going to continue on in this study. So you stay tuned and we're going to continue studying about salvation. You're watching The Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs. Write us at 2920 New Hartford Road, Orangeboro, Kentucky, 42303. Visit our webpage at www.southside-churchofchrist.com. Join us on Sunday morning for Bible class at 930 And Sunday morning worship at 1020, Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. Wednesday night Bible classes for all ages at 7 p.m. Write to us for a free correspondence course. And or a subscription to the Old Pass, our teaching bulletin. Tune into our radio program, What is Written, from 1230 to 1 p.m. Sunday on 94.7 WBIO. And continue to watch The Ancient Landmark on Monday at 9 p.m. Wednesday at 5 p.m. or Thursday at 11 p.m. And we're back again.
again, I want to continue in our study together. We ended talking about Jonah and the book of Jonah and talking about how that in the book of Jonah we see uh, how that, that salvation is of the Lord. And we saw basically five uh, areas, or five tenets of this salvation where we talked about God, uh, God's providence, God's word, then the preacher, and finally the sinner. And whenever you combine those things together, we find this uh, time wherein folks could be saved. Now, in the, in the Old Testament, in the book of Jonah specifically, these people were being saved from God's wrath. They were being saved from destruction. Forty days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. That was what was said, among other things, as Jonah spoke the words of God. Now, today you talk about salvation, and we're talking about salvation spiritually. We're talking about salvation from sin. We're talking about salvation, ultimately then finally in heaven, where one can be in eternity with God. And so that's what's so beautiful about this, is as you see these parallels taking shape. We saw that Jonah is the gospel of the Old Testament, and certainly that is a true statement, as the good news, all right, the good news is taken to these folks, and specifically taken to Gentiles. That's who these Ninevites are, you know. They're Gentiles. We've known about the Ninevites since the days of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 10 and verse number 11, and they have continually been on the radar screen, you might say, all the way through these Old Testament scriptures. And so that's what you find here in this text. Here is God. God is with Jonah, isn't he? God has also seen the Ninevites and their sin. And so God takes Jonah and uses Jonah to preach to these folks. But another thing we noticed was God's providence. We say God's providence is found here, and certainly that is the case. Whenever Jonah tried to leave, he tried to run away. It was that strong wind God sent that caused the storm, of course, that ended up uh, causing him to have me thrown overboard, okay, so that he would not go to Tarshish and run away and all that. So there's God's providence seen there. Number two, God's providence is seen in that fish. The fish was prepared so that Jonah could be uh, kept alive for those three days and nights. We have found not only a prepared fish, but we have seen also God's providence in the gourd. You remember that gourd that after Jonah got so mad and upset and he sits on the east side of the, of the city, and there sits under his, his little booth or lean-to, whatever you'd like to call it, this little place here he's set up. And it's obviously insufficient for the east wind that God has prepared also. And God prepared that east wind. And then God prepared the gourd. So here's an east wind and here's a gourd that has come up. And that, under the shade of those leaves, he is now uh, pleasant, uh, comfortable, he is satisfied. He is happy now, contented in this situation. But then there's also a worm. And the worm was prepared by God too. And the worm that killed that gourd. So that now he has no uh, shade. He has nothing there with which to find shelter anymore during those days. And so God has been all the way through that. God's providence, that is the way in which he causes his will to come about. God causes his will to come about through natural means. Through the natural means of a gourd or through the natural means of a fish or a wind, blowing wind, whatever it may be. And we think about cases such as that today. God's providence is still seen in the lives of people even today. That wherein his will, God's will, is going to come about. God's will is going to be accomplished and so uh, we see God's providence. I can tell you cases in my own life where I'm, I know God's providence was there. God's providence is made clear. As, as I think about actions taken in my life and things done in my life that has led me up to this present point. And it happens with other folks too. It happens with you. And perhaps it is that by God's providence you're watching this program right now. 
Perhaps that's what it is. And through the provident, may, I don't know if you've ever watched this show before or not. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. If you've never watched this show before, what turned you on to this show? What was it? Was it just you had to be flipping through the channels and found us? Was it that you were recommended by a friend? Or whatever it may be, that you were recommended to watch this program? Maybe you've seen us, and maybe you have visited with us in, in, uh, in our uh, church services sometimes, or whatever it may be. But now you're watching. And here you are studying God's Word. See, God's providence has opened up to you. And now you, what will you make of it? What will you do? Yes, we still have a choice. And yes, we can still choose to run away. But God's will is going to be accomplished. It's kind of like it was in the days of Esther. In Esther chapter 4 and verse 14, whenever Esther did not want to go see the king, you remember, first. She said, I can't go in to see the king. He, he, I can only go if I'm invited. He hasn't invited me. And uh, if I go and he doesn't lower this golden scepter toward me, why well, he says, she said, he'll kill me. And that was just the rule, that if he did not lower that golden scepter that, as if to give you permission to come before me, then you would be killed. So Mordecai's answer was then that who knows but you're in the kingdom for such a time as this. He says, now if you refuse to go, he said, there will be a deliverance brought by another. But he said, don't think you're going to escape if you don't do, if you don't act, if you don't do this. And of course she goes. And again, God's providence is seen all the way through. God's providence is seen in that book, just like it is in the book of Jonah, just like it is in several other books of the Bible. And so we need to appreciate today God's providence. The fact that the Bible is in our hands. The fact that the Bible is made available to you. And that you have, perhaps you have two or three or four in your house. Perhaps you have the Bible on CD or a DVD of someone reading the Bible or whatever. And the fact that you have that and it is, it is at your fingertips. The fact that there's Bibles on the computer. The fact that you have those things is, speaks to God's providence. God's providential care, making sure that His Word is spread and that His Word is available to the masses. It is available to people all over the world. And when you think about how the Bible is on the computer, how the Bible is on the internet, and it can go all over the world, how God's providence has seen to it that His Word is found and His Word is available to people uh, regardless of, of what country you live in, regardless of, of you know, position in life, status, whatever. There's God's providence. But you know, God's providence alone won't save anyone. And what I mean by that is <coughs> that just because we are uh, providentially brought together, just because it is by God's providence that we, are, we, we might meet one another, or that you might watch a television program like what we have. It does not mean that that is the end of things. For in fact, number three, you must have God's Word. God's Word is what saves. In Romans 1 and verse 16, Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So he said, here is God's Word. Here is the gospel that is preached, the gospel that is taught. And he says, it is there too. It is the power of God unto salvation. And ain't it interesting that in the book of Jonah chapter 1, God says, Jonah, you go and preach the, pre the, preach the word to go and speak the word that I bid you. Jonah 1. And he says, cry out against them because their wickedness has come before me. In Jonah chapter 3, in Jonah chapter 3, you go into Nineveh, that great city, and you preach unto it the preaching I bid thee. There it is again. Jonah, I want you to speak my word to these people. I don't want you to talk about what other people have to say. I don't want you to talk about uh, you know, other, uh, other uh, ideas and other philosophies. The words of men, don't go in there and do that. You preach what I say to you. 
That's what was going to save those people. And that's why I'm trying to show you. It's no different today. <coughs> In Romans 1.16, the gospel is God's plan of salvation. In 1 Peter 4 and verse 11, there in 1 Peter 4, verse 11, he said that if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, the very utterances of God. That's the point. If you're going to speak, you speak as the very utterances of God, of the God of heaven. And folks, that's what it takes. That's what we need to be doing. That's what needs to be a part of our lives is God's word. You're not going to be saved without it. You're not going to be saved by going to, to the words of men, to the to the synods and to the creed books and manuals of men. You're not going to find it in the writings of Eastern philosophers. You're not going to find it in the writings of Western philosophers. You're not going to find it with mom and dad. You're not going to find salvation with grandma and grandpa. You're not going to find salvation in yourself. You're not going to find salvation in those places. Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is in His Word and nowhere else. And so we need to be paying attention to that. We need to be listening. And listening well to what the Word of God says. That's what these folks had to do. Didn't they? And so <clears throat> when John was told to go, he refused. The second time he's told to go, he went. And when he went, he preached just God's Word. Only God's Word. Now, if I'm going to have salvation, that's what it's going to take. But it not only takes God, and all it takes is providence, and not only God's Word, but it also takes preachers. It takes those who will open their mouths and speak. That's what it says of Philip in Acts 8, verse 35. It says, Philip opened his mouth, began to say scripture, preached unto him, the Ethiopian eunuch, preached unto him Jesus. In Matthew chapter 5, and verse 2, it says that also about Jesus, that he opened his mouth. And preach to them. You know it's very important that folks open their mouths and preach. Uh, you have, of course, you have to know what the word of God is. You can't just be saying anything. But it demands a preacher. In Romans chapter ten and verse thirteen, where it says that very thing. He begins in verse thirteen by saying that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But he says, How shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? Verse fourteen. How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? And as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them who preach the gospel of peace, bring glad tidings of good things. Verse 16, Romans chapter 10. He says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel of Christ. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, verse 17. And so now you look in that passage, and he says, in order to be saved, in order to be right, in order so that you might call upon the name of the Lord, it demands preaching, all right? It demands one having been sent to be pre a preacher, to preach the word that will be heard, to then hear that word, to believe that word. And that faith motivating you to obey that word. Remember that verse 16 in Romans 10? They have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? We'll know the ones who believe it when we see them obey. And no other way. Faith and obedience are forever joined together in that verse. We know who believes when we see the ones who obey. And if you don't obey, you don't believe. It's just that simple. So it takes preachers who are going to preach, who are going to open their mouths and speak. That's what we find all the way through Scripture, is that whenever somebody was going to be saved from their sin, whenever somebody was going to be made right in the sight of God, it demanded a preacher. It demanded a, a one human talking to another human. You know, you can go back and, and a couple examples come to mind and uh, where God very easily could have just spoken and told men what to do, but he didn't do it. But rather, he used preaching. In the book of Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, whenever Saul of Tarsus was on his way to Damascus, and he was knocked to the ground, the Bible says, and here's a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? 
And he said, Who art thou, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. And he said, What wilt thou have me to do? Acts 9 and verse 6, he says, Go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And he went into the city, and Ananias told him what to do to be saved. Now, wouldn't it have been a whole lot easier for Jesus to just to say, Well, now you need to believe on me. You know, you need to repent. You need to confess your faith and be baptized. Wouldn't have been easier for Jesus to say that. He said, what will you have me to do, Lord? And Jesus could just go ahead and just say it. Well, no, that was not God's plan. It wasn't God's intention to do things that way. Rather, he wanted men to talk to men, as it were. He wanted humans talking to other humans. Over the book of Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, when Cornelius has a, has a vision and sees this angel, talks to this angel, and he said that, that your prayers have come up from a memorial before God and all of that. It had been very easy then for the angel to say, Now, Cornelius, you're not saved, though. And so now here's what you need to do to be saved. But he didn't do that. He says, You sin for one Simon, whose her name is Peter. He lodges with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. And he tells him there, He will tell thee what you ought to do, or what you must do. He'll tell you what you ought to do. And that's Acts chapter 10 and verse 6. And so there once again, here's Jesus speaking to somebody. Another time, here's an angel speaking to somebody. And it would been very easy for them just to say, okay, here's what you need to do, and laid it out, one, two, three, four. But they didn't do that. They made sure, this is God's plan, that humans spoke to humans. And so that's what we have here. God could have spoken to Nineveh, couldn't he? He could have said, whoa. He could have said, stop right now. And Nineveh, you straighten up, Nineveh, you repent. He could have done that. But he did not do that. He chose you to use Jonah. And Jonah was the preacher. See that? And so that's what we need to appreciate. And so on times like this, see, God's not going to speak to you personally. He's not going to go and whisper in your ear. He's not going to go and, and you know, write something on the wall. He's not going to do that. He's going to use humans to speak to other humans. He's using me, see. And he's using me to preach through the medium of the television uh, so that you'll listen. And that you'll follow, not follow me, not follow my words, but follow the words of God. To follow what is said there. So that you and I can be right in the sight of God. We can all be right in the sight of God. And we can all go to heaven one day, those who will follow him. And so then that brings up the last point, then that because you had God, set what's necessary for salvation, God and his providence, God's word, preachers to preach, and finally need sinners to listen and to obey. You know, you can have all of these things. You can have God and his word, and, and you can have his uh, uh, providence. You can have the preacher's there to preach, but if the sinner doesn't listen, if the sinner doesn't do, listen and obey, if he doesn't do that, then there's no salvation, is there? There's no salvation then at all, right there, because the one who is in need of it does not submit to it. See the problem? And so now you have this sinner who's not doing what he should. And you go back to Jonah chapter 3 for a moment. Here comes Jonah, and he speaks to these folks, and he says, you know, 40 days and then of it shall be destroyed. He preaches the preaching God told him to preach. But what if everyone had turned on Jonah? What if everyone just ignored him? I mean, they don't have to turn on him. What, they don't have to turn on him and attack him and kill him. They could, and, and sometimes prophets were killed. But what if they just ignored what he said? What if they just went on with their daily lives and said, okay, that's fine, Jonah. Yeah, we understand, but we're not going to listen to you. What if they took that position and that attitude? What if they did it? If they did that, they're just as lost as they ever were. They haven't gained anything. They haven't come closer to God. They haven't done anything to make themselves right. It took the fact that the sinner would listen and obey. That's what it takes. You know, that's the difference between a wise man and a foolish man. Really, that's what Jesus said. Jesus said the difference between a wise man and a foolish man is the difference between listening 
and disobedience and listening and obedience. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24, beginning, you can read down through there, Matthew 7, 24 to 27, and read about the wise man and the foolish man. That parable concerning a wise man who built his house upon a rock. And when the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house, he said, and it stood because it was founded upon a rock. But he said there was another man who was a foolish man. He built a house. And the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it because it wasn't founded on the rock. It was founded on sand. Now what was the difference between these two men? When you look into that passage, he said, the one who hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken to a wise man. The one who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, he said, that man is the foolish man. What's the difference between wise and foolish? The difference between wise and foolish is one did it and one didn't do it. Now, come back to this point here. What made these folks wise in Jonah chapter 3? He said, because they did it. They did what the Lord said. And that's the key to it all, folks. That is the key to everything, is to do what the Lord says do. That is it right there. In Jonah chapter 3, you'll see that. And the reason God turned from His fierce wrath and the reason he turned away and did not destroy them and wouldn't for another hundred years until these people went back to their old ways and that's caught up in the book of Nahum. But they would not do that. He would not do that here because they repented. They listened and they obeyed. And God recognized what they were doing. He'll recognize what you're doing as well. Will you listen? Will you listen to what the Lord says in His Word when He says you need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God? You need to repent of your sins and confess your faith in Him and be baptized? And that that plan of salvation is, is preached and taught in Acts chapter 2, beginning verse 22 down to about verse 38. And that not only is it there, but it, we find in Acts chapter 4 and 5, we read about in Acts chapters uh, 8 and Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapters 10 and 11, in Acts chapter 16, in Acts chapter 18, and Acts chapter 19, you read about this plan of salvation all the way through the Scripture. All the way through. Now, how is that possible? It's possible because those folks listened and they did it. They listened and they obeyed. Now, God had done everything He's going to do. God had made uh, uh, today. He had, by, by this time, He has already, by the time you're watching this, program. He has already sent His Son. He has shown His love. He has sent His Son. The blood has been shed and the Holy Spirit has made this Word possible, has made it in a readable form. They inspired men to write what they did so that we have it today in our own languages and we can follow it, we can live by it, we can obey it. Will you do it or not? See, the question is not what will God do. God's done it. The question is, what will you do? What will I do? That's the question before us. How will we act? How will we obey? Will we obey or disobey? Just how will we live? That's the question. And see, I can't answer that for you. You've got to answer that. Oh, I'd love to answer it for you. Because you know what I'd say? I would say, if I was answering it for you, I would say that you're going to say yes. And you're going to do what the Lord said. I can't do that, unfortunately. I want to. But you've got to make that decision and you've got to do what's right. Just like I've got to do what's right. And whenever I do that, there comes a salvation. There comes salvation. So here's one who followed the Word of God, even in the New Testament, to follow that plan of salvation. And you can be saved. Salvation is of the Lord. But you'll notice here in Jonah chapter 2 and verse 9, salvation being of the Lord. Salvation being of the Lord was not only for the Ninevites. Salvation being of the Lord was also for Jonah. You see, another key point here that is made, another key point that we see here is that God's children can go astray. God's children can turn away. Jonah was here in Jonah chapter 1 and he goes the exact opposite direction of the way he ought to go. 
And you know there are warnings all through the New Testament talking about Christians who were warned. In, in the book of, of uh, Timothy, in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 4, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. The Spirit speaks expressly. The Spirit expressly said, Can you get any plainer than that? That some shall depart from the faith. But well, you can't depart from a place you've never been. And he said, the Spirit says expressly, some are going to depart from the faith. Do you believe it? Furthermore, to leave the Lord, to turn away from Him, the Lord allows us to return to Him. You can repent. Acts chapter 8 and verse 22, you can repent and you can pray God's forgiveness. And you can be forgiven. You can be right in the sight of God if you'll do it. You see, that's the Lord's plan of salvation. It's His plan of salvation initially, as we've already talked about from the book of Acts, but also for one who has turned away from Him, you can return. Salvation is of the Lord. And, and, and the Lord stands with open arms, ready to accept you back when you will listen and you will obey. That's what it takes. And you look in this beautiful passage of Jonah and you're going to see also the gospel here in the Old Testament because here what happened with Jonah pointed to Christ. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, he said there, and he began about verse 38 and continued to read down through and he says just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of that whale, he said so also the Son of Man shall be three days and night in the heart of the earth. Yes, my friends, Jonah declares that. And Jonah, because of what he did, here, points us to Christ. He said the Son of Man shall be three days and night in the heart of the earth. And he was. And by being crucified and by being buried three days and three nights and in rising there triumphantly, he declared the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection, Romans 1, 4. And by and through the resurrection, that's what makes your baptism powerful. 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. <clears throat> Those things being true. <clears throat> Those things being true. Don't put that off. Don't delay. Don't deny what the truth is. Don't deny God's word and will. Accept his plan of salvation. Follow it and live it all the days of your life. So thankful for this time and so thankful for our study. And certainly look forward to being with you again. You think on these things. If we can study with you anymore, we want to do it. Until next time, we'll be you. You've been watching The Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs. Tune in each week as we study God's Word together on Monday at 9 p.m., Wednesday at 5 p.m., or Thursday at 11 p.m. The Ancient Landmark has been brought to you by Southside Church of Christ at 2920 New Hartford Road, Hornsboro, Kentucky, 42303.